This episode is brought to you by Arden Labs Education. Sign up today to learn advanced concepts in Go, Docker, Kubernetes, Terraform, and more. Visit ardenlabs.com forward slash education for more information. Hello, welcome to the Arden Labs podcast. My name is Bill Kennedy, and our special guest today, all the way from Boston, is Mark Bates. Hey, Mark, how's it going? Good, good. It's great to see you again. Been, it's been way too long with all of us kind of being stuck at home. Oh, I miss it. I miss it. Horrible. It really it's horrible. Is. But <laughs> for lie. those of you on uh, YouTube, you can really see what Mark's been his his COVID project. I'm going to call it the COVID project. Is that it? This music room that he's built behind it, it looks fantastic. <laughs> Uh, well, I've actually had the studio for a while now. Um, I went to Istanbul, no, sorry, not Istanbul, Budapest, maybe four or five years ago with Matt Emanetti for CraftCon. And we just talked music the entire time. And when I came back, I decided that's it. I'm going to gut out this old room in the basement and make a studio. Wow. So, yeah. It yeah, looks I, fantastic. Well, thanks. Yeah. I mean, you can't see the really cool stuff, which is on this side of the camera, all the, like the preamps and all the cool stuff. And then there's a live room next door as well. And you're able to record and produce everything down there, right? Have you done any of that yet? Have you, have you produced well, anything? I mean, yet? Absolutely. I've been, I'm halfway through a master's program at Berkeley college of music right now. So I've been that, that's really been my COVID project. Um, wow. Once we got locked once we got locked down and I couldn't travel every other week, which is pretty much, well, as you know, like what we did, uh, yeah. <laughs> we were always on the road. Um, it's a, something I've always wanted to do, but I couldn't because I was on the road. Like you need to be in a studio. You need to record stuff. Like, you know, I, I was doing, you know, up till three o'clock in the morning on some courses, like every single night, you know, you couldn't do that on the road. So that's really been my COVID project is been hanging out here recording and working on my masters yeah yes yeah, so i'm gonna i'm gonna suggest to everyone to definitely just even look at the first few minutes of the youtube recording so you can kind of see mark's uh mark setup but before we get deeper into your journey kind of through tech and life why don't you tell everyone give it like the two minute elevator kind of pitch on what you're doing today and where, where you are today Okay, uh, that's a great question. Well, uh, today, you mean like, what am I working on today? Yeah, kind of like, like, other than this music, because we've talked about that, like, what else is occupying your day? Yeah, so right now, uh, these days, uh, I work with Corey Lanou, and we have a company called go for guides which we do educational um, go training. So we go into enterprise companies and, you know, Fortune 500s, Apples and Intuits and Coinbase and all these other companies. And we train them um, on Go and other related technologies. Uh, we're also uh, starting a kind of 12 week university course as well. So um, for kind of individual enrollment. So that's kind of what we've been doing. I've been teaching Go really now for the last five years. Um, I you know, did consulting before that, but we've kind of tapered that all off now. And we're just doing the uh, the teaching, which is hands down probably the best job I've ever had. <laughs> I I am so excited about this 12-week kind of university-style course you, you've put together. I want it to be really successful. Like, I, I'm really curious. Um, I want it to be successful. That, that's it. I, I want there to be a demand for that, you know? I do, too. And we're seeing that. Um, and, you know, we talked about, you know, I'm doing my master's program. And it's the master's program is what we're using as my master's program at Berkeley is what we're using as the template for 12 weeks. Right. Um, we, you know, I, I just started doing this program and their courses, their online courses at Berkeley are phenomenal. I really cannot say enough about how well written they are, how well presented they are. Right. I mean, these are people who know education. <laughs> right. So as I'm going through and I'm like, wow, this is how you educate people. Wow. Not like we, you know, and when I say we, I mean, all of us, all of us who are teaching go, it's like, I, I'm like, have we been doing it wrong? And it's not <laughs> that we've been doing it wrong. I just think we can do it better. Um, you know, and so that's kind of what this 12 week course is. We're using the same program canvas, um, which is, you know, used by 4,000 plus educational universities. Like every Ivy league uses it. It's the 
learning management system. Um, so I've been doing a lot of coding, just trying to get our stuff like uploaded and onto that platform and, and use that. But the idea of like giving tech students written work to do, for example, each week, the assignments have written work. They have to write essays. They have to do things. Uh, they have to create pull requests and defend those pull requests, defend their changes and all these other kind of things, right? Um, so it's really kind of a fun way. Of, it's a different way of doing it. And I think what you're doing is so interesting because you could potentially go to the state and submit this to make it even um, credentialable, right? Like, yeah, because what we're doing right now, like, like I could give you a, a certificate saying that you completed art and lab stuff, but like, dude, like, you know, it's, it's not, not, you know, know it's, it's not, not like going, going to university, university right? right? So, so I think the way you're structuring this and the material, you could submit this for accreditation, right? Like that would be super interesting. It would be. Yeah. We've, you know, it's uh, it's a, it's a really interesting way of doing it. Like we don't give out, we're not giving out certificates to everybody. Um, you actually have to earn the certificate. You have to get, I believe it's an 80% on the course to get a cert. Yeah. So that's it. If you don't do the work and your work isn't up to speed, you could say you took the course, but you're not going to get a cert. You're not going to get the badge. Yeah, yeah. It, right. Um, yeah. We want to make sure that people don't go out there and just be like, oh, I got this thing. Because right now, like that's, you know, you have the same problem. You know, we just say, oh, we took this class. Great. Does that make you a qualified Go developer? <laughs> <laughs> no, not that I'm saying right that now, make you a qualified Go developer. We, we just want to say <laughs> is like, hey, we at least made them jump through these hoops and, and validated it. They learned at least 80% of what we were trying to teach them, right? Um, and I think that's going to be an important part of it all. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm excited about it. All right, let's, let's step back because we're going to get back there. My favorite question to ask everybody when we start this podcast is to kind of think back in the time machine and and share with everybody that first experience that you can remember um, working on a computer. Like what's the first thing that kind of pops in your head and maybe get a general idea of how old you are, what year it is, just so we can understand the what tech was like at the time. Yeah, I'm gonna age you today, Mark. That's fine, the beard, <laughs> the beard definitely does that for me. Um, <laughs> well, I actually turn 45 next week. So it's Samir, Brian, me. They get all the really good birthday jokes first, and then I'm kind of left with whatever's left over at the end uh, <laughs> on when they announce on Twitter. So uh, I'm 45. My first computer experience would have been in early to mid 80s. My father was working for, he was a draftsman, an engineer, and he was working for a natural gas company. And they were auctioning off some of their old IBMs to the employees. Kind of a thing right like you could put your name in and if you won you got this at like a really good deal uh and it was big old big old ibm two floppy drives you know keyboard that could kill somebody you know like the keyboard itself weighed 50 pounds um, <laughs> and, you know monitor you know i think it was like it might have been it was a color monitor it might have been eight colors nice. I'm, like i might be pushing that but it definitely had some colors to it um, it took five minutes to boot up to DOS. I remember that. <laughs> you'd put the discs in, you turn it on, and you'd go away, make a cup of tea, and you'd come back, and then it would be ready. Um, so that was my first experience was with getting that computer. Um, I used it probably more than anybody else in the house, but I never used it for programming or anything like that. I played a few games. Um, I did word processing on it mostly. I wrote all my papers for school. Like I was the only kid in like fourth or fifth grade turning in printed assignments in 1980 oh. something right <laughs> it was fairly ridiculous um but that would have been the first experience and then we had a computer from that point on um i didn't do anything with it from a programming kind of standpoint until about 96 96 at that point you're 96 you're just out of high school at that point then right Two years, two years out of high school. Yeah. So when I graduated high school, I graduated in 94. And this is the part that everybody loves. Uh, I went to school in Boston uh, at a school called Suffolk uh, for pre-law. I was going to be a lawyer. I want to stop for a second in 94, you being a lawyer, because I have to imagine. Well, like... really, I wanted to be a judge, but go on. <laughs> okay. I, let's, I want to talk about high school for a second. 
because I imagine that you were a musician in high school. You had bands in high school. Mm -hmm. Did you care about grades in high school? Did you care about your academics? And what else were you doing? Was it purely a music sort of world for you those four years? Yeah, high school, I, I didn't care for high school. Um, <laughs> I wasn't particularly popular, um, as one can imagine, right? I wasn't a cool kid. I wasn't a nerd. I was kind of, I wasn't a nerd per se, but I was definitely geeky and weird. Um, and yeah, I, I played a lot of music and most of my free time in high school was spent in my, either in my bedroom or then later at my parents' garage doing music um until the wee wee hours of the morning um when i wasn't in school i was working if i wasn't working and i wasn't or i wasn't out with friends then i was in that room producing music uh and i have reams and reams of cassette tapes all of, matter of fact i got a whole stack of them right there that i'm trying to transfer onto the computer <laughs> at some point um i didn't care about grades grades were not for me schooling I, I, I don't know. I, I enjoy learning and we can definitely talk about that more because obviously I'm back at school. Uh, so obviously I enjoy the process, but what I didn't enjoy was learning things I didn't care about. Um, and I was naturally smart and I could pick up a lot of the subjects that were being taught to me reasonably well. So I would not really do much work. I wouldn't do homework at all. Um, uh, I just hated it. And I would come in and I'd do the tests and I would do really, really well on the tests. And so I'd end up with like a B minus or a C plus on the course, <laughs> right? Just because so I, did so, I did so well on the tests that it made up for the lack of other stuff. But you can't get away with that, at least here in Florida anymore, because my high school uh, kids, homework is like a large percent of your grade. They'll fail for not doing the homework. You almost will pass if you just do the homework here, right? Like, I wasn't like that back then. It was all testing. It was all yeah. about the tests, right? So that was it. I mean, you know, I, again, I didn't do any of this work, and yet I still ended up in, like, advanced placement math classes simply because my test scores were so good. You know, I remember, I think it was my junior year, I'm sitting in this advanced placement math class, and I've got a leather motorcycle jacket on all these zippers and I got long hair and I got earrings and I got a sex pistols t-shirt on my doc martens <laughs> red jeans or you know I got my feet up on the desk and everybody else in the class is like super tight and they get their buttons all the way up to here you know like yeah. and I'm just this guy in the back of the room you're the anomaly in the class like who is this kid yeah so grades grades uh they mean a lot to me now in college uh, at, at Berkeley simply because I really, really, really want to do well on this course um, because it means so much to me. When I find it something that means so much to me, the effort, I will put that effort in and I will do that work. And so I imagine that music meant a lot to you then. So you were putting a, a lot of, were you able to play in any parties? Like if you had high school parties or stuff, did you have a band where you could play? I didn't. I always, uh, I had people I played with, like, and, you know, there was always this kind of mixing and matching. It was high school. So you didn't get a lot of like, at least I didn't find consistency. Um, there weren't a lot of good players in my school itself. Um, certainly not in my age range that I knew of. Um, so I did have some friends that went to some other school. So it was a little difficult, but we did play some stuff, you know, a party at uh, some show at Tufts Field. Um, Tufts University, we played that, um, which was right down the street from where I grew up and, you know, other kind of a few graduation parties and that sort of stuff. Um, but we didn't do a lot of uh, live performance when I was in high school, which is probably for the best because we were terrible. <laughs> we're going to have to pull those demo tapes, right? We're going to have to have the Mark, the Mark Bates demo tapes from like 90s, you know, and Kind of playing around now he's about to burn them all here we go oh, no. <laughs> got some. what i got this is uh this is from college oh now mark is showing all of uh i can't believe mark is showing cassette uh, eight uh, this is from tapes. 1995 hindu ringo, ringo such an englishman uh and oh this one here is from god knows when satan's children won this would have been from either middle school or beginning of high school. We're gonna to have to get those out on the internet so we can listen to them. So, so you, we started this conversation with you saying, I, I'm going to school after high school because I wanna 
to go to law school to be a judge. So, okay, tell me what's going on in your in your life or your head heading out of high school that you're thinking law school and I want to be a judge. I wanted to be a judge because I really enjoyed Night Court. Oh, the show, the TV show, Night Court. What a great... I wanted to be Harry. I wanted to be the judge. Because <laughs> I think I'd be good at, you know, that you could see me in Night Court. Yes. Absolutely. I think so. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. Um, so, I, I don't know, your you music... It's interesting. I didn't want to go to Berkeley College of Music when I graduated high school for a bunch of reasons. And it's ironic that I'm going there now. Um, one is I certainly, as a musician, I don't think I had the chops and I still don't think I have the playing chops to get in as like, say, a guitar player or a musician into that college. Um, as a music production major, that's a different <laughs> kettle of fish altogether, right? Um, so there was that, but also growing up in Boston, people didn't want to play with Berkeley students. It was very interesting. So you'd go into a guitar store and there'd be signs up all over, you know, looking for a drummer, looking for a bass player, a guitar player, whatever. No one was ever looking for guitar players because they were a dime a dozen. Um, but down the bottom, it would say no Berkeley college students wanted. Why? Because they were just too technical? They were too technical. I mean, Berkeley started as a jazz school. Right. So there was that. And so there was always this impression that they overplayed and stuff like that. And you're doing kind of punky club stuff. You don't want somebody going be, be, do, 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 like all over the fretboard, you know. Um, so that I didn't think I had that in me. And I don't know. I just back then, I guess I didn't have the confidence in myself to say I'm going to try and do music. But it took me a year and a half of failing at Suffolk to realize that I... <laughs> That what was going on there was not for me. Um, I had a radio show and I loved the radio show. And my last semester, that was the only reason I went to college. I'd go in once a week and do my radio show. Uh, oh, so wow. I was failing. I was failing out of college um, pretty badly. Um, so that means like in 96, this university being a judge in night court is over. Pretty much. You. So by the end of 95, really. So a year and a half, a semester and a half. Um, I decided to take a leave of absence from Suffolk. Um, and I wanted to apply to this school in Liverpool, England that Paul McCartney had started. And I had read about it a year or two before. And I wanted to actually apply for the very first year of the school. And my mother wouldn't let me. Yeah, I was going to ask you what your parents thought about about the university experience you were having? Were they on top of you? Were they upset? They, they were like, your life? Like They didn't know that things were going so poorly at Suffolk. Which is, you know, <laughs> I was living at home, um, but they had no idea things were going so poorly. Um, and so I decided that, like I said, I was going to take a leave of absence. I didn't tell them any of this. Uh, and I went and applied to the school in England anyway, um, because... Well I, well, I knew they wouldn't let me if I told them I was going to. <laughs> so I just went and did it. Um, I, they, they said, okay, great. You can send us a tape for your audition. And I was like, no, 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 no. I'm going to be in England. When is the audition? And they were like, March 20th. I'm, I'm going to be there then. Uh, so I kind of had to tell my father that I was flying over to England to do this audition for college. Uh, and he was none too thrilled. He did not care for it at all. I love my father. And normally he is very supportive. Um, but you got to imagine him, you know, his 19, 20 year old son, whatever it is, looking at him saying, I'm dropping out of law school. Right. And I'm auditioning for college in England that I may not get into. And that's my only plan. That's it. I have this plan. I'm going to audition for the school. So you have money, right? I mean, you've been working. So are, are, are you, did you, were you the one that was paying for the, the courses no, my at parents. Suffix? My parents. parents were doing. Yeah. And then. Like you've never been to London before, right? Or had you? No, been I had London? actually been. I, I, um, I was part of a youth exchange. I was a peer leader in high school, and I was part of a youth exchange. Um, and when I was fifteen, uh, a bunch of British kids, English kids, came over for a couple of weeks, uh, and hung out with us. We did a bunch of stuff. And then the following year, so that would have been the summer of '93, uh, we went over there for two weeks. And hung out. Nice. So, okay. and then I had gone, I'd been a couple more times since then. And I still have some incredibly close friends uh, from that trip. And, you know, um, 
that like I said just absolutely love dearly they're like family but to me. Your, your parents must be saying fine you're gonna go there you're paying for it so you gotta get hotels you gotta get oh for the trip yeah the trip was all about me um well one of my friends from the youth exchange uh simon who's still very uh, very very close with he was going to school at the university of liverpool so i was able to stay with him which okay. was great so it, it cut I, I just slept on people's couches and i went to london afterwards and i slept on a friend's couch down there you know like that's what you do when you're a kid you sleep on couches. Sure. it's okay it's cool yeah. um i kind of miss those days in a way just kind of sleeping at whoever's houses doing whatever you know um and yeah so i i my father didn't like it. He kept saying, well, what are you going to do if you don't get in? What if you don't get in? What if you don't get in? What if you don't get in? I'm getting in. What if, what if you don't? I am. <laughs> you know, one of those things. Yeah. Um, and so I did get in. He was not keen about, oh, oh, that was the other thing. Yeah, yeah. No, I want to hear about the, I want to hear about the uh, audition. Oh, the audition was fun. Um, so it was an all day audition. There was, um, there was only three. 37 slots or something like that, less than 40 slots on the music program. It was very, very small school. Uh, my entire graduating year was just a couple hundred people, right? So that's every group, musicians, dancers, artists, actors, whatever. Um, so very, very small. Uh, and something close to 10,000 people auditioned to get in that year oh, onto those one of those 37 slots whatever so i'm still not quite sure how i did it because i'm really not that good um but it was a fun day they they broke there was uh 10 of us auditioning they broke us into groups of five and one that we had to spend the morning writing a commercial jingle hmm. as a group which was kind of interesting right um and then in the afternoon we had our individual auditions and interviews and again, I'm not sure I got in because I got caught cheating on my ear test. <laughs> we're starting, I'm sitting there with the guitar, uh, guys on piano, and he says, okay, I'm going to play a note in the piano, play it on the guitar. Fine. He plays an E, I play an E, whatever. And this goes on for five or six notes. And he looks at me and goes, are you looking at the, my fingers? And I said, yeah. And he goes, don't. <laughs> Oops, sorry. Uh, I just thought you were just matching notes. I was like, oh, I know, I know that one. It's a D. <laughs> um, that's still better than what I could have done. So, I mean, that's impressive enough. <laughs> then I was be, I got oh, so cheeky. Um, <laughs> one of them was asking me, what would I do with a degree from LIPA? That was the kind of acronym for the school. What would I do uh, with a degree from LIPA if I got one? And I just like dead serious. Just looked at her and I was like, I probably put it in a nice frame over my desk. <laughs> mark being mark <laughs> uh, so anyway i got in i flew over i did the audition i got in um my parents were not happy about it but they decided that it was better than me not going to school so they they kind of they signed on <laughs> they didn't really have a choice all right so i want to fast forward how, how many was this a two-year program there Three, three. They do three their bachelor's. They do bachelor's programs in three years. Yeah, yeah. That was the so, other thing. It's a diff completely different type of program. They don't do here. You do like high school for two years, and then you start <laughs> studying the thing you're interested in, right? Like you yeah, go to yeah, school yeah. for English, and you're still doing science and language and all these other things, right? In England, if you go to school for English, you just read and write a ton. Like you don't have taking biology. You're not like you're. It's a very focused course of study. The liberal arts is not a requirement there. Yeah, exactly. So it's only three years. It's much nicer. <laughs> what I, I want to fast forward a little bit. So you do your three years. You didn't get kicked out, which could be a whole other podcast. And... I did get deported at the end, but that's another podcast. <laughs> yeah, that's another podcast. <laughs> you finish, you graduate. You now have this music degree from what I have to imagine is still considered today a, a, a pretty prestigious music school because McCartney's involved in it. What's next, Mark? Because you're a computer scientist from my knowledge of you. You now have this well, I get amazing from there music degree. Well, yeah, I, I wanna know what happens after graduation. You go back to the US, do you stay in London? You have to make money. I, I'm sure everybody's tired of seeing you on their couch when they wake up in the morning. <laughs> like, like, I wanna fast forward a little bit through the music school and, and kind of get to where we are next. Sure. So to do that, we're going to rewind back to 1996. 
Because <laughs> okay. music school plays a key role in how I got here. Okay. If it wasn't for going to college in England, I wouldn't be a computer scientist. Uh, if it wasn't for that horse, I wouldn't have spent that year in college kind of thing. Um, I got into to Lipa uh, in March, April, whatever. The audition was in March. So I was going over in September. That's when the year started. So I started working 80 hours a week just to make money, right? I needed, I needed cash because I was going to school. Uh, and I got a job working in the security department of a company called Lotus, who were just acquired by IBM a few years before that. They did Lotus, Lotus spreadsheet. Yeah, Lotus 123, Lotus Notes, that company. Um, wow. They're located here in Boston, in Cambridge. Um, and so I got a job doing like data entry and stuff over there. And I was working two out of the three shifts a day. Um, so I was in there like 16 hours a day, five days a week, whatever it was, um, just doing data entry. And the thing is, there was maybe an hour's worth of work total for both <laughs> shifts. Like that was a combined total. Um, so I had a lot of free time and I had something I didn't normally have at home. I had a, a pretty decent computer because I was at a computer company. Uh, and a pretty decent internet connection because I was at a computer company. I wasn't dialing up um, like I was at home. So I spent a lot of time on the then burgeoning internet. All right. And I decided that it'd be really interesting if I could put my music on there. Not necessarily my songs, because obviously you couldn't upload music back in 1996. That just wasn't going to happen. But I could put lyrics, tour dates news you know for all my fans right uh, all my fans who back in 1996 had never even heard of the internet uh let alone had a computer to get on one right um and so i started kind of playing around with it but we didn't have books and tutorials and all that sort of stuff if you know i don't know if you ever tried playing with html in 96 but i did it was yeah rough. there just wasn't anything out there we, we had no resources um and finally one of the lotus engineers i was friends with and talking to he kind of let me in on the big secret he said try doing view page source wow look at that game there over game over right <laughs> so then i could cut and paste and start creating uh web pages for myself so when i went to school in england i told you this does come back um we were a brand new school right i was a second class ever to graduate and the school was brand new and we, everything was done on computers. It was very unusual at the time. We all had email addresses, everything, all our communication was computer-based and stuff like that. And they also gave us an insane 10 megabytes of web space. Mm -hmm. 10 megabytes, can you imagine that, Bill? You know how many websites you could build back then and put up for 10 megabytes of web? Yeah, as long as you didn't have any images, you were, you were golden. Even then, well, images were so small too back then, don't forget. You had to compress them all because you couldn't download them if they were too big. Um, so anyway, I went and wrote what I always call the first blog. Um, I, I invented the blog. Um, basically, <laughs> well, I created this website for my family and friends back home with just kind of like what I was doing in England because phone calls were incredibly expensive. Not everybody had computers. So someone could just go and print it off, maybe at work or whatever, and pass it around kind of a thing, right? Um, and then um, at the, near the end of my first year, I got a job, I, got, I put together a band. Uh, and so we now had, we were the only band in Liverpool with a website, right? In 97 or whatever, right? And all of our posters were tacking around the city, all have a website down the bottom, which is just like, everybody's like, what the? Wow. Not ahead of your time, Mark. You're 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 ahead of your time. Absolutely. So what happened <laughs> was, um, as we're playing these shows, we're talking with the other bands. They started asking us about the website thing, and so I started building some websites for other bands in Liverpool in exchange for opening gigs, you know, slots on a bill or whatever, you know, case of beer, so whatever it was. Trading. It was you're 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 basically trading your time for the things you needed. Exactly. Right. I had this really crazy skill that no one else had the ability to build a website. Um, and I wanted to play, you know, the Lomax on a Saturday night. Um, so that's. What computers were you using to build this from the school? There were computers? Yeah, just at school. Yeah. 
Um, yep. So then um, fast forward a little bit, the summer before my last year, the school had a program called Get Serious. Um, and what it was, was they got the school got a lot of money from uh, both the, the, the government, both uh, British and local governments, Liverpool governments and stuff. So they had to do programs that gave back to the community, which is fantastic. And they still do a lot of that. And this program, they was about it was a six week summer program for local musicians in Liverpool bands and stuff in Liverpool they weren't part of the class obviously um so I produced a few songs for the CD that came out and stuff but more importantly I got the I convinced the head of music to pay me to let me do the website and to pay me to do the website um and so now I was getting paid to do a website for the school um they were paying my phone bill to to dial in um, wow. Yeah, which uh, local calls in England were very expensive back then. Um, the phone system, it was very, very expensive. Uh, and I did buy a computer that summer, too. I had been robbed a few months before my apartment had been broken into and everything I owned was stolen. It's like $10,000 worth of music gear and stuff. I know. Um, so <laughs> yeah, it was pretty bad. That's another podcast, that story. Yeah. Um, but I turned uh, the insurance money, part of it anyway, into a computer in Liverpool so I bought my very first computer so you're doing schooling and now you kind of created a freelance company in a sense doing work too I mean you're a busy guy right because I have to imagine your studies are pretty intense you know it, it, it's Mark so Mark is Mark can just he knows what he has to work on so it sounds like Mark always figured out the, the, the minimal amount of time he had to put in to get the, the grade he needed so you'd have time to do well, it. Well, it's like, what, what's the minimal amount of work to get the maximum amount of return? Um, you know, uh, for example, my final year, my, my final project that I had to turn in was a four song EP I produced for my band. So you talk about using a situation to your advantage, right? Uh -huh, um, yeah, I yeah. got all this great studio time because I was doing this project, but it was really just building it. <laughs> anyway. All right. So look, so you graduate, you got this freelance job, you're building websites. So what happens now? You're established right now with income in Liverpool. Come 1999, I'm getting ready to graduate. I am engaged to my now wife, Rachel, um, who was from Liverpool. That's where I met her. Um, and so she still had another year left of university. She didn't, we didn't go to the same university. Um, she's not a musician, but she still had one more year left. She was a year behind me. I had a fiance uh, in England. I had a band in England. Um, and so I decided I'm going to stay in England. Makes sense. Um, <laughs> Are you allowed to stay in England? I mean, you're there on a student visa, I imagine. So yeah, well, that's where we're going to next. So <laughs> um, I know I need a job because I'm going to need money and I'm gonna need a place to live and all sorts of stuff. So I find a job doing programming for a real estate company in London and Reading. And it was going to be like working on their website it was ASP and stuff like that. And I don't know how I got the offer. Um, Cause I didn't know ASP. <laughs> it just flagged my way through the, through the interview, but I got the job. Um, the problem came when I tried to apply for the visa. So I applied for the visa and the British government was like, no, um, you, you just graduated college or about to graduate college. In order to get a work visa, you need to either work in your trained field as a musician, or you need two years professional experience in the field you're trying to go into. Really? Yeah. <laughs> so I couldn't get the visa. Wow. Um, yeah. I couldn't get the visa. The company could have applied and said that I was the most qualified person in all of Europe <laughs> to do the job, but mm. that clearly would have been a lie. Um, so I got deported. I got kicked out. Um, my friends threw me a happy deportation party with a cake and everything. And you're, uh, I'm going to call her your girlfriend right now. Must be devastated because... You're, you're going to the U.S. None of us were happy. <laughs> None of us were happy about it. Let's just put it that way. No one was quite keen on the idea, um, except for my parents. They were very happy about me coming home. Oh, and you're going to move back into your parents' house? Because I don't think you can do that at this point. I had you've been to. been on your own. I wow. have. 
Yeah. Um, I stayed there for about a year or so um, until Rachel graduated. And then we got our own place in, in Somerville. Um, but even then, there was still another year where she had to travel back and forth before we got married. Um, so it was kind of two years from when I graduated to when we got married. And there was this kind of constant back and forth with her. But yeah, so I had to move back to the States. So I needed a job. I had like I, I knew I wanted to fly back and forth to England. I knew I wanted to fly Rachel back and forth to America. And I knew I wanted to, well, we were going to get married. So I needed money for a wedding. Um, so I needed a gig. And the year is like 97, right? It's 99. 90, 99, 99. All right. So it's 1999. That's where, that's where luck really played a, fa a hand in it. Because in 1999, we were in the middle of the dot-com boom. Um, if you remember, it was yeah. insane, just crazy, 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 crazy. And if you, I always joke, if you could spell HTML, you got 30 K a year. <laughs> and if you knew what it meant, it was another five, <laughs> right? Because it, it, they were just that desperate for people. Cause it was like I said, nobody knew what they were doing. There was yeah. no experienced people, none. Cause it was just all brand new territory. And so I had a resume that had some experience i'd actually built websites that i could point to on the web um and so i got a ton of job offers in the boston area um just because i could <laughs> you were a unicorn really so it wasn't like i got into so i got a job in cambridge um and so that's kind of how I got into it professionally. Like that was the beginning of my professional career, but it was never an intentional, I'm going to become a computer programmer. I'm going to become a computer scientist. Like this is going to be the next 25 years of my life. That was not my intention in 1999. My intention was to just deal with this marriage, flying back and forth. I just needed cash. And I was still recording and I was putting another band together. And so I was going to ask you that. So even though you're, you're, you're working this job, I mean, music still has to be incredibly important. So you're, you're still trying to not for, not to make money just because it's your passion, right? To put bands together and play. Uh, no one makes money as a singer songwriter uh, or in a rock band <laughs> until, until you get there. Right. Like, um, so money, you know, you can just stop asking about money and music because they're just so independent, right? I mean, you're talking to me as a computer scientist, so I'm not making money from music. It's as simple as that, <laughs> right? If I was, you wouldn't be talking to me. But do you think, do you still have in your head that you're going to be making money as a musician? Is it, is, is, do you still have that dream in your head that, that you can do it? in 1999, 2000. Oh, then yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, no, I was gonna be a rock star. <laughs> that was absolutely 100% um, what was gonna happen. Uh, and I worked very hard at it, um, uh, very unsuccessfully. <laughs> you know, it's funny, I do all this uh, work on my masters and, and just last week they were like, take one of your songs from your catalog and do X, Y, and Z with it and explain why it's commercially viable and successful and I'm like, Nothing's commercially viable. No one ever bought my stuff. I have proof <laughs> nothing was commercially viable. Like, you know, I never sold CD one for crying out loud. Like, so uh, it is quite funny. But yeah, I it, music was still very important to me. And in 2005, 2004, 2005, I quit development. So was it the same job that you landed in 99? You were there. How many jobs did you have in between? Um, so let's see. I worked at any day. We got acquired by Palm. Palm Pilot. If you remember Palm Pilots. Dude, you were in these big companies. Lotus, Palm. I, I find it really interesting that you you found yourself in these tech giants, really, right? Like, or just it, it, all of this was completely like I, I've again never really set out to do this. We got acquired by Palm. Um, we were the very first acquisition Palm the company ever made. Of course, a year later, the company was tanking hard <laughs> and soon went out of business, if you remember. Um, but I got to work on, which was really cool, like wireless stuff in 2000. I was working on the Palm 7X doing wireless WAP wow. stuff. And I was like, this is so cool. I had, I was like walking around with a Palm 7X with an unlimited data plan 
that the company had gave me because I was working like so I was just like all my friends I've got the big thing that's like this I got my like, antenna and I pull it up this big rubber antenna and I'm like what time's the movie at <laughs> uh, but yeah so I did I worked there and I worked at McKesson the pharmaceutical company for a while were you bouncing between jobs because you were bored for the most part or is it just there was different tech well, the first job, I mean, the company was tanking and we just had to get out. Like everybody was getting laid off. So it was fairly obvious we needed to. Um, so I was bouncing around for, and I, I bounced around as, a, as an employee for maybe the first 10, 12 years of my career. Um, I don't work well for the man. <laughs> but you're saying now in 2005, about six years later, you decided you don't even want to be in tech anymore. I don't want to be in tech anymore. I had done a project. I can't remember what the name of the project was um, that resulted in a hundred thousand lines of XML configuration. Oh my God. Yeah. It was the oh struts, struts hibernate project um, and scripts and all that. Cause you know, let's, let's write programs in XML. Yeah. Data driven XML to tell the code what to do. Yeah. Yeah. And so, I had, it was this huge, massive project and a hundred thousand lines of XML, just configuration. Um, and I was like, I do not care for this at all. <laughs> this is not what I wanted to be doing with my life. Like, I, like how did I get here? <laughs> and it really yeah. was this moment of like, how did I get here? Um, this isn't what I wanted with me with my life um and so i quit development um and i went to a local studio called q division who a very big studio here in boston um as a matter of fact i think about a year or so before i went there stacy's mom by founders of wayne had been recorded there and stuff like that a lot of like james taylor had just had a grammy award-winning album that had just been recorded there so it's like the studio in boston uh and i walked in there and said i want to be an unpaid intern Wow. <laughs> um, and so I spent the next two years starting as an unpaid intern, like doing dishes, getting food for the bands, cleaning up, like any little menial task. Really? Uh, yeah. And I'd get in there at 10 in the morning and I'd leave at two, three in the morning. Now you're married already and your wife is, you know, uh, now in the States, right? She's working, you have an apartment and she's just, she's saying, what did she say when you told her, I'm not going to make any money for the next two years? I want to do this. Rachel is an amazing woman. Um, she is the strongest, most wonderful person I've ever met. Um, and she is so supportive of everything I've ever done. I could not at all, 100%, I could not be here right now without Rachel. Yeah, she, when I say this stuff to her, she looks at me and she goes, yes, you should. That's what you want to do. Yes, do it. And she's yeah. always been like that with my career. She she knows that, you know, if you know, I always say if the if you're happy, the money will follow. I mean, it's an old saying, but it, it's I, I think it's a hundred percent true. And I've had no problem in my career doing that. When I followed the things that have made me happy, I have made money out of it. Um, I've had to work to make the money, but the work I've enjoyed. Right. And that's really the important part for me. And that's why I don't think I've ever really worked well for the man. Um, but yeah, she was great about it. She, she was totally supportive. Um, by the end of those two years, so I was, I was a paid engineer and I worked on projects and I have my name on credits. And so you work in the board at that point, you work in the oh, yeah. big boards. Oh, yeah. And... yeah. Keys to the studio, alarm codes and stuff like that. And I got to work with uh, some of my favorite local artists. Uh, I mean, literally people who inspired me as a songwriter, like Bill Janovis from Buffalo Tom, for example, he sang on a solo record I did while I was working at the studio. And he is he I played one of his songs at my audition. <laughs> when wow. I had so uh, to get so, to work so, with all these people. So 2008, you're starting to get paid. I would, you know, roughly oh, man, two years later. You're jumping the gun on these years, buddy. 2000, end of 2005. And it, so 2004 is when I obviously, I, I left. So two years, end of 2004, okay. beginning of 2005. I'm working in the studio. I did have some contracting. I was doing a little bit of consulting here and there just to pick up a few bucks. 
um, but nothing like full time, nothing big, you know, little things for friends, whatever. Um, and a friend of mine who I'd worked with in my very first company called me up and he's like, hey, have you seen this thing called Ruby on Rails? And I said, no, and I don't care. <laughs> he's like, no, man, you got to check this out. This thing's pretty cool. I said, Greg, I'm out. I'm out, Greg. I'm done. I, I don't care about programming anymore. It's like, just play with it fine i go to the o'reilly cookbook tutorial do you remember that one bill yeah it was like the only tutorial uh step-by-step -step tutorial it was like you had dhh's whoops video <laughs> this o'reilly cookbook um and i walked through it and i built it and i went god damn that's good <laughs> <laughs> What was it? What do you think it was that you that your initial that is good? Is it just because of all the pain of HTML and everything that you had gone through for ten years? What was it that you saw in Ruby at that moment? That, that... it was uh, the terseness. It was just the expressiveness. It was how simply I could put together a website. It was just that. It was just how simply and quickly and easily you could do it. I mean. Setting up Ruby, setting up Rails, and God knows running Rails in production was a nightmare <laughs> back in those days. You're shooting your mongrel instances every 30 minutes. But um, I, when doing this, you know, I created a model that connected to the database, had all my fields there, and it was two lines. And one of those lines was end. <laughs> yeah. So it was just like, wow. There's no XML here. <laughs> like I just did all this in a few lines of code. Um, and that kind of sparked something in me. I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. Um, but what really sparked something in me was at the same time, Rachel and I were discussing the idea of having kids. You know, we were kind of that, you know, I mean, five years into our marriage and we were starting to discuss having kids and that wasn't going to happen on the salary I was making <laughs> salary on the random $90 a day I would get because it wasn't like I was booked six, seven, eight days a week. <laughs> um, so Greg, the reason Greg had sent this to me was he was joining a brand new company. He was number two at the company and he wanted me to be number three. And he wanted to use Ruby on Rails and he wanted me to be the director of architecture and build the app, build the team and all that sort of stuff. He saw something in me that no one else saw, um, to be perfectly honest. He, he, I mean, because like I said, I was retired. I wasn't even doing this anymore. And not only did he want me to come back and program, he wanted me to build the team. He wanted me to architect this thing. He wanted me to be employee number three and his right-hand man, he was the CTO. Um, and I was, you know, so... Rachel and I talked about it and the six figure salary certainly looked better for raising yeah. kids. It didn't hurt. It did In not hurt for raising kids. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so that's kind of how I got back into it. So Ruby on Rails brought me back into development. Um, I wouldn't have come back. I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if I'd come back for the money if it was still Java. You know, I, I know I needed the money. We were looking, like I said, having a family, but if it was Java, I just don't know if I would have come back. You know? Interesting, because you really kind of fell in love with the Ruby, and I think maybe in your head you were like, "I really want to take this for a test ride. Like, I, I really want to see what we can do with it." And we need the money right now, anyway. So I'll just do another two-year diversion because that's what I do. I'll just divert for two years, and I'll be back in the studio before I know it. Like that's going on in your head, right? Pretty much. <laughs> I mean, no, and I kept putting out music during that time too. I had bands and stuff too, so it's not like music never stopped. You were still leveraging that studio. For those two years uh i wasn't in this house at that time so no not no the, the studio that you had just left oh no no no, still, no 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 you <laughs> uh, uh so i was okay. just leveraging my own home studios at the time um which were anywhere i could put them in the house in whatever house i was <laughs> so tell me about this company now you're number three the, tell me just a tad about the project and w were you able to get it done was it successful did it were you able to accomplish what you wanted to accomplish in the two years or whatever? I accomplished, definitely accomplished a lot. Um, and it was one of the most crazy two and a half years of my life. And I built a wonderful team, um, one of the best teams I've ever worked for. Um, 
and did a lot of really cool tech. The company was called Helium. And what it was, was you could take, like, let's say there was a, a, a title, like best ways to groom your cat. Like that was what we used all the time. People could go and write articles on best ways to groom your cat. And then those articles would get, go through this ranking system, this peer ranking system we developed with a special algorithm or whatever. And the good stuff would float to the top. The best articles would float to the bottom, henceforth helium and the worst would float to the bottom. So that was gotcha. what the product was. Um, it was fun. I had a really, really great time uh, for the most part. Um, had a lot of issues with the CEO <laughs> politically. Uh, <laughs> Well, I speak my mind and I'm a truth speaker. So when you hire me, you get my opinion. I'm not going to hold it back because you're the CEO. You hired me to tell you from a technical perspective what I think. I am going to tell you from a technical perspective what I think. Uh, and this goes for clients too. You know, I, I always say to them, hey, you cash, you're, you're the ones writing the check and I'll do what you want at the end of the day, but you're paying me not to be a coder, you're paying me for m what I know and for my opinions. And so he didn't like to hear no. He didn't like to hear it's going to take more than two weeks. You know, <laughs> uh, the time he came in and said, can we build Facebook into the app? And I said, not quickly. <laughs> <laughs> and he went, well, they did it. I'm like, they have $5 billion and 100 developers at the time, whatever it was, you know, like. Give yeah. me all those things, and we'll. And it took them three years. <laughs> so, you know, it was a, it was always a kind of a struggle there. But um, what came out of that? A couple of things came out of that job. Uh, three big things really came out of that job. Um, one is near the end, I started working on um, a distributed Ruby framework, very similar to Rails. We had some issues where we wanted to have distributed applications, so we wanted to use like BRB. Uh, and Rinda and stuff in Rails and do kind of, you know, that kind of communication across networks. So I started doing a lot of work on distributed programming and publishing these frameworks and stuff. And like Peter Cooper did some articles on, and that's how I got to know Peter Cooper, who's just a wonderful person. Um, absolutely. And I got some fun stories about Peter too. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, that's how Peter Co Cooper picked it up. But Another thing happened. Um, I met this guy over the internet. His name is Diogo. No, Diego. No, Diogo. Sorry. Tired. Um, and he was getting into Ruby. And so I was just helping him over the internet. And I'm going to get back to Diogo later because he's also very important. Um, I got laid off the company in fall of 2008. Um, I was booked to speak at my very, very first Ruby conference. My, my very first speaking gig ever was at RubyConf 2008 in Orlando, Florida. Um, and I was going to be talking about distributed programming. So I went down there and did my talk. And then later I was in the hot tub, hotel hot tub with a guy named Obi Fernandez. Um, and we had been, well, we had had a few drinks. Let's just put that and Obi was the series editor for Ruby uh, at Addison Wesley. He had seen my talk earlier that day and basically said, hey, I think that'd make a great book. You should come and do a book for Addison Wesley on DRB. Um, so I did. And that, that book was, it wasn't a huge book. None of my books have ever been big. But when you, once you write a book, your value goes up. Yeah, you wrote the book. I always say it's like you could just say I wrote, you don't get rich, but you can say you wrote the book. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, I literally wrote the book on that subject. You know, like, um, and so, yeah, you don't like you make nothing from the books. Like, you, you know, I still get residuals, but they're they're not like they're tiny. Yeah, they're tiny. Um, but that's fine. You know, again, I did it more for well, one, because I'd always wanted to write a book and how cool is it? when you can hold that, you know, and you can hold it in your hands and say, I wrote this. This yeah. is mine. That's what motivates me to have it in my hand. Like every time I want to quit or I don't want to work on it, I just think I'm going to have this in my hand if I keep moving forward. It is so cool to hold it. Yeah. Just, oh, it's, a, it's an amazing feeling. Um, but it does increase your worth as, a, as an individual on the market. Um, so that was, that was a big, big thing for me. 
So that gig got me back into development, got me into Ruby on Rails. It got me leading teams, architecting sites. I got to do this book because of it. Um, and later that Diogo person that I met through all of this ended up at Apple and he's still there. Uh, and because of that, I have had a long, over the last say 10 years, I have done a lot of work for Apple, either as a consultant yeah. or as a trainer. Um, matter of fact, the very last like gig I flew to was last year, February of last year, um, was Apple. <laughs> so I spent a week nice. in Cupertino just as Corona was like really picking up speed um, there. So that gig changed kind of my life in terms of kind of making my career explode, you know, and, and, and giving me this career. Um, and what I found was I enjoyed programming in the Ruby. I did not enjoy the programming in the Java, <laughs> as we know. And so I realized I enjoyed programming. That was when I first started to realize that, okay, I think I can do this as a career. This is something I actually do enjoy. I just had the wrong technologies. I was working with the wrong things. So tell me now, it's 2008, you're, you're, you're doing a lot of this Ruby stuff. What happens that gets you to transition into your next programming language, right? Because you, you're not doing Ruby anymore. You, you said in the beginning, you're teaching Go. So when does this transition, I guess, from Ruby to Go happen? What happened that made, made all this? We can fast forward quite a few years now, obviously, because um, we get talking about Go now. Um, so I'm going to say it was the summer, year before the very first GopherCon. When, when was the very first GopherCon? 14. 14. So 2013. Yeah. So I think it was what, Go 1, 2 or something like that then? Go 1, 2. Just, I, I started in 13 in April. It was like 1, 13. 1, 12 had come out. So maybe 1, 13 was already. I started on 1, 12 in like April of 2013, I believe. Anyway, whatever version it was, it was 2013. Um, and it was just kind of all over the place. Everybody was talking about it. <laughs> Um, and I had seen Matt Amanetti give a talk uh, in Colorado. It was a, I think it was a Ruby conference. Um, it was RubyConf. And he gave us talk like seven languages kind of a talk, right? And he had seven languages, seven weeks kind of a thing, right? And so he was going through all these different languages that he had done. And one of them was Go. And he spent a lot of time on Go. <laughs> like clearly he enjoyed that out of all the other languages. Um, and, you know, so kind of seeing it, someone I know talking about it now, like in front of me was kind of interesting um, and not just reading about it or seeing people mention. So that's kind of when I started playing with it um, and started really enjoying it. And then in the end of the summer, beginning of the fall, I was going to Istanbul to give a talk at a conference uh, in Istanbul. And I think I was doing a talk and I did a talk on, Angular, Backbone, and Ember. It was like a comparison between the three and whatever. It caused all sorts of grief because the Ember guys did not care for the fact I put facts on their slides and <laughs> stuff was way too big and heavy and didn't work. Anyway, uh, neither here nor there. I'm not going to get into that Ember debate <laughs> again. So I spent um, a month, one weekend in Istanbul with Blake Miserani and Andrew Garand, who are also at that conference. Um, and they both talked about Go. It was a one-day conference. They both, two people out of a one-day conference talked about Go. Andrew was on the Go team at the time. You know, he was a DevRel. And Blake was just huge uh, into, into Go. Um, and he had come from Ruby, too. So I knew of Blake. He had done Sinatra in Ruby. Um, so he had a name there, too. So this was somebody I had already known. Um, and so I spent the whole weekend, we went sightseeing and all sorts of stuff together. So I spent the whole weekend talking to them about Go. And so that's kind of what got me into it. And then the first Go for Con was announced, I think maybe in January or February, 2014 or something like that. Um, and so I snapped the tickets were like 200 bucks. <laughs> if you remember, they were like ridiculously yeah. cheap. So I was like, oh, I'll grab some, I'll go to Denver and check this thing out and see what it's like. Uh, and that was, that was pretty much it for me. Yeah. And uh, nice. within a year, I was, I had been doing these Metacast videos, weekly kind of 
10 minute, 12 minute videos all on Ruby. Well, mostly on Ruby, JavaScript, things that I like. That's why I call them meta. It was like programming stuff. And I started introducing Go into those. And then at one point I was like, I really just want to do Go. <laughs> I just want to talk about Go. I don't want to talk about Ruby anymore. I've been talking about it for years. I don't have anything else to say and nothing exciting is happening there anymore. Like the language isn't moving forward. Rails is just Rails. Like there was nothing there, but Go was really interesting. And so I started adding them and then eventually I just said, you know what? I'm going completely Go in this podcast series, in this video series. Uh, and I expected my viewership to tank <laughs> you know, because it started as a Ruby series. It wasn't a Go series, but my, I lost people, but my actual numbers went up and wow. they kept going up. And I was like, oh, I'm on the right track. <laughs> you know, and then I sold all that to O'Reilly, I think, before the second GopherCon or something like that. So we've got like 10 minutes left and I want to um, I want to kind of talk about your transition, like, so now you become a professional Go developer, right? Do, do you do that still on the kind of a consulting side or did you end up taking some full-time work? And then from there, what happens that you start Gopher Guides? Because, I, I, you know, that's an interesting transition because it's a whole different kind of business model, different everything. So maybe you can, within the next 10 minutes, kind of maybe talk about some of that. It, it's not that unusual for me. I... Before I left Ruby, I was even considering getting into the Ruby training space. Um, I had done training uh, that gig in 2006 because there weren't any Ruby developers around in 2006, right? Um, there was even less Ruby developers than there are Go developers. Like the shortage of Go developers pales <laughs> compared to that, right? So I just found good developers and trained them, right? I just trained them in Ruby. I'm like, you're a good developer. You'll pick this up. And that's what we do with Go. Now, you know, that's what all these companies are doing, you know, is they're hiring really good developers and training them to be Go developers because good developers can be trained, right? Um, so I have been consulting now for maybe 11, 12 years, shortly after the birth of my second son. Um, and yeah, so I've mostly just been doing that. And I met Corey and we really hit it off well. Uh, and I met you and we really hit it off well and you were doing training and I started doing some, you know, did some with you. Um, and then kind of, you know, Brian Kettleson started doing training. And if you remember, there was kind of just like, all of you get into training. And I'm like, boy, that definitely looks good. Uh, I, <laughs> well, again, I had always thought about, it. I, I had done the Metacasts. I had done training before. I like teaching. I like, I hated being a manager I'm a terrible manager, but I loved being a mentor to the engineers on my team. Like that was always my favorite part of the job is helping them become better and making them successful, right? Like I didn't care for dealing with vacation requests and, you know, timeshare, whatever, all that crap that you deal with as a manager. But I loved working with them. I loved seeing these people grow and develop into spectacular engineers. You know, um, that that has always been a passion. I've loved seeing that since day one. Um, so, it, you know, and I've done workshops and conferences. I mean, I when you're doing talks and when you're doing conferences and stuff, you're teaching, you're educating, um, whether you know you are or not. Uh, and it's a thing I just really, really enjoyed. Um, and so I said, I kind of want to do this more. And Corey was like, hey, you know what? I kind of want to do this more too. <laughs> uh, and that's kind of how we got into it. And, you know, we started doing a mix of consulting and the training. Uh, and now it's just the training. But yeah, I, I can easily see myself when I retire from programming, going to become, say, a, a professor at a college teaching, say, music production or something like that. Teaching has kind of always been a big thing for me. But that's interesting because you're you're thinking in the future it's gonna you're gonna you're gonna end up back where you started with music and really teaching music. Though I guess is there any tech related to that teaching too at that point? I mean, because because tech is so involved now with music. Well, I mean, there would have to be, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, but what level is it? Will I be? You know, I don't think I'll be programming for the rest of my life. You know, I don't think I'll be in tech. For the rest of my life um if that's just not who i am and we just spent an hour talking about the variety of my career and we really only scratched the surface because there's a lot more 
that I do that people don't even realize. Um, I, I've got all sorts of other hobbies and interests apart from music, apart from programming that I could easily indulge uh, and spend time doing. But um, yeah, I think, you know, eventually I have to retire from, from programming. I think we all, I mean, we all have to retire at some point, right? Um, and when I do, what am I going to do? What am I, how am I gonna fill my time? Um, I don't think I'm gonna fill my time programming Go packages. <laughs> I'll probably fill my time doing something musical. Um, and whether that's becoming a professor at a school or something, you know, writing film scores or something, I don't know, um, but it'll be something. Uh, and ultimately um, I have, uh, we've set it up or we're in the process of setting it up so that God forbid, when I finally go, my entire studio, all my guitars, amps, preamps, everything uh, along with a chunk of my estate will be put aside to create um, like a program for uh, underrepresented youth to learn music production and stuff like that. So ultimately it's always, it's always gonna go back to, to music for me. No, and you've established over the last year or so just building out the studio and everything. So I can I can see it. I mean, if if you could do that full time today, I mean, would you do that? Yes. Is there is there <laughs> something holding you back? Are you paying just, me? That's, like, what's holding you back? That's what that's what, from, that's from what holds back, right? Um, that's what holds most people back from their passions, from doing them. You know, kind of unfettered like that, right? I have two kids. I have a mortgage. You know, uh, my kids are going up to college, you know, my in four years, whatever, my oldest just got into high school. Um, I have, you know, bills to pay. <laughs> I would love nothing more than just sitting here all day and just make music with my friends, right? Um, but I can't, unfortunately. Um, so I have to stay up all night doing that because <laughs> I have a day job. But yeah, eventually, then that day job is no longer required, you know, um, because I've retired and I've saved the money or, you know, I've had an exit, my wife's had an exit, you know, something that changes the situation, then yeah, then at that point, I, you know, when I retire, I will be doing music more, a lot more than I do now. Yeah, it's brilliant. And then once you get this degree, how far, far off, how far away are you from graduating from Berkeley at this point? Is it still a year or two? Um, I'm halfway through the program. I did a lot of courses um, relatively quickly through COVID um, because we weren't going anywhere. And I was like, I gotta, I have this studio. I need, I need to be in this, this room seven days a week right now. So I'm going to just double down. I did so many courses. Um, but now I'm kind of backing off going to just like one a semester because the world's opening up. The last six months really burnt me out. Uh, they were some really intense classes I took. So uh, I, I still have, I'm, well, I'm in the middle of one right now, so five more after that, so five more semesters. So I'll be graduating at this pace, June of 2023. Do you have a hard time getting motivated to go to that class and do the work when it's virtual? Because I know I needed a physical classroom and I almost didn't graduate university and I needed that. If this was online, I don't think it would ever, I, I'd always find a reason to do it later. You know, how are you, how are you managing that? Uh, I struggle sometimes. I'm not going to lie to you. I mean, we all struggle, right? You have weeks where you're like, God, I can't do this. I just, this is too much. It's too much. I can't, um, or I'm too tired or, you know, whatever, but you know, the live classes are like an hour or so. Um, so they're pretty easy to, you know, you, you just got to sit, <laughs> you know, it's not like, I don't even have to put clothes on. I don't have to leave the house. I can, I can sit in front of a screen for an hour. I do it all the time. I watch TV, you know, like that, that the class is probably the easiest part of it. Uh, it's re it's the reading materials, you know, all the coursework, the assignments, like getting motivated to do those things can be difficult. Um, and it depends on the assignment. You know, I mean, I've got a lot of work at Gopher Guides. <laughs> you know, I have a family and all this other stuff going on. So if there's an assignment I just don't want to do, I'm taking a music business class right now, which is interesting. Um, but for somebody who decided he did not want to be a lawyer, this class is basically all about being a lawyer. So <laughs> Everything circles back over and over and over again. <laughs> right. So like I'm, I'm looking at contracts and budgets and I'm like, yeah. 
So it's, it's a struggle in some weeks. It really is. Um, what gets me to do it is there is an 11 59 PM deadline on Sunday night that if you don't get it in before then you automatically lose 50% of your grade. So you get in it at midnight, you have already failed. Wow. So there's, there's, there's a motivation to get it done, <laughs> you know, just on that principle alone, right? Putting that. And we're, by the way, we're doing the same thing at Gopher Guys. If you don't get your materials in by the proper time, you will fail that assignment. What, have you filled that first class? Like when is the, is there still registrations open for that 12 week class? And when is that, when are you planning on that to start? So we have a closed beta right now you know, the handful of people. So that's obviously not <laughs> uh, useful to anyone, but the first public class uh, starts September 27th and registration still is open. We're going to close it uh, three weeks before. However, we have had a ton, ton of applications. Nice. Um, so, and we're only taking, I think a maximum of 25 or 30 people. So there definitely will be people who, won't make the fall cut uh, and they'll just have to wait unfortunately to the next one so i i recommend applying now applying well <laughs> we ask some questions and stuff because what we don't want we want to make everybody successful you know and that's why we're doing that we're not just taking their money um, because to take their money is to say we don't care about you we just care about your money and and that's not true we want you to be successful and so we want to make sure you're ready for this class and that you're taking it for the right reasons and that you're going to put the work in um you know because we don't want your money if you're not going to do it yeah i know but, that. we don't want your money if you're not going to put the time in plus the amount of time that you two are putting into materials and then the amount of time that you're going to be teaching because this isn't like you, you have to be there. I mean, both you and Corey have to be available. Um, the last thing you want is a student. Yeah, you don't want a student that's not taking it seriously because the amount of time and effort it's going to take on your part. Like, Yeah, and it's going to bring the rest of the class down. Um, yeah. You know, because we have a lot of stuff baked in for discussions, um, peer exercises, reviewing each other's PRs and stuff like that. Like, so you want to make sure that the other people in the class are solid because the other people in the class are going to depend on them at different times. Yeah. I, I think what you're doing is brilliant because I think we, maybe there's another two or three years of corporate three day corporate stuff, but eventually even like with Ruby that ends up going away. Once there are enough co-developers in the world. Yeah. Yeah. And then what we saw with all the, like the iron hacks of the world where everything moved in this format, you'll be in the forefront of that. And it's going to take companies at least two years to, to even catch up. So I, I think it's a brilliant move for Gopher Guides. I really do. Yeah, we're, and, you know, we've got a bunch of other classes we want to work on, obviously, as well. You know, um, and eventually there'll be an entire program you can do that will take you through every aspect of Go. Yeah, no, I think it's great. I want to retire in three years. Yeah, don't, don't yeah, we all? So. I'm tired, dude. You know, I'm 52 this year. I'm tired. I'm enjoying it, but... Um, what you guys set out to accomplish is a huge amount of work. So I'm, I'm, I'm one, I'm glad that the Go community is going to have this type of training. And I'm glad it's coming from you too. Eventually, yeah. I mean, you know, we won't last forever, uh, you know. So I guess get the training while you can from us, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you get tired. You get to be uh, our age. And, it, it, you know, like I said, I've been doing this for 25 years or whatever. And it's, and it's fun and it's still enjoyable. But the question is like, for how much longer is it still yeah. enjoyable, right? Um, so yeah, you do have to start thinking about what that's going to look like down the line. And part of, you know, doing this sort of thing is nice too, because I know that we're setting the community up for success even after we're gone, <laughs> right? Yeah. If four or five years down the line, Go For Guides isn't around anymore. I know that the people we have trained have been trained well and they're out there and they're building the community and they're growing the community. So, you know, we're passing that torch. <laughs> no, I, I tell every one of my students, right? You're all teachers because you're going to go back to work and you're going to have to teach the same stuff. So I tell people to wear two hats in the classroom. One is a student and one is a teacher. Like how would you teach the same material I'm teaching? I recommend everybody, uh, every developer, 
everybody personally, it doesn't really matter if you're a developer or not. You, you need to get into some form of education to be better at your job. Um, it's, it's as simple as that. You, whether it be, like I said, conference talks, meetup talks, brown bag talks, uh, you know, get your development team to lunch, you know, get pizzas in and just do a little 30 minute talk on a package you found. Doesn't matter what it is. I used to do that at companies all the time and I'd make everybody do it. And it could be something they were working on, something that they just saw that was cool, but they had to do a presentation. They had to teach it to us because when you teach and you know this bill, you have to take all these concepts and resynthesize them in your own words and, and be able to communicate that clearly. And to do that, you need to understand those concepts. To teach is to solidify and understand those concepts in your mind and put them into your own words. Uh, and again, teaching is broad. It's not in a classroom setting all the time. <laughs> you no, know, and I so agree. when you teach, and I recommend everybody does this sort of thing, you are learning and you are making yourself better. When I wrote any of the books I wrote, I thought I knew, say, 80%, right? But by the time I was done writing that book and essentially teaching that material to somebody else, I realized I only knew maybe 10 or 20% going in. <laughs> Right. So by re learn by taking these concepts and trying to resynthesize them, put them back out together, I learned so much more about this subject. So yeah, yeah. that's my big thing is I, I think teaching is wonderful for everybody. Educating is wonderful for everybody because we learn through education, through teaching. Um, so that's kind of my biggest, if anybody wants to take one takeaway from this, it's that and you ask how I got into teaching and it's, it's that it's, I love it. I love learning. So when I teach, I learn and I love seeing other people learn. I love seeing a glint in their eye, that moment when it pops, right? Like I don't get that on virtual and it really bugs me but when I'm standing in front of a classroom of people and you see that person and they're just, they're, their face is all, and all of a sudden they go, <laughs> it's just, it's wonderful. It's just a wonderful feeling. Um, and so, yeah, that's, I guess that's, I don't know. I don't know what else to say about than that. <laughs> right. Well, we are out of time. And I know there's th things like um, Buffalo and things we didn't get to talk about, but I want to make sure all that gets into the show notes. But um, if anybody wants to reach out to you after listening to the show to talk about anything with you, Mark, what's the best way for somebody to kind of find you on the intranets? Uh, I'm all over the intranets. Uh, I'm Mark Bates everywhere. <laughs> Twitter, GitHub, Slack. Uh, I'm incredibly unimaginative with my handles. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, you can just find me. I'm easily findable. Let's put it that way. All right, brilliant. We'll have those in the show notes too. So Mark, thank you for spending the last hour plus with us telling your story. Um, I mean, we've talked before, but there are some things there I didn't even know. So it was, a, it was really nice. And I just love how you kind of music's been weaved in and out of your life and you've taken practical approaches to having to, you know, work and you just, it's almost like a sine wave with you with the music and the computers, right? That's what, kind of what I see, so. Like, you know, it's just all intertwined. That's why I kept saying, like, I, I got to tell you about music schools to tell you how, why I'm a developer. The two yeah. are very much so intrinsically linked because of what happened there. And I can't tell you that I got into development without telling you about that, you know, and, and that's, and I can't tell you how I got into Ruby without telling you about how I quit and went to music, you know, like, it's just yeah. been an interesting career. And I just have to say thank you to my wife for supporting me in every <laughs> insane decision I've made and this kind of weird patchwork of, of, of uh, a career I've built and to, you know, kind of everybody who's supported me generally through it you know it's not easy to do to build that sort of a career and everything I do you know there are other people who have helped me out along the way I mean I can't say enough great things about Corey um, as a partner and as a person and as a friend like I love him so much <laughs> and I couldn't be doing this right now without Corey and I couldn't do this without Rachel and I couldn't do this without you and I couldn't do this without every other person I've worked with and come in contact with and who has supported me in the community 
just as I'm trying to support others, you know, the people who said, hey, you can give a talk. We think this subject is worth you talking about. And hey, we do think you'd be cool to, to, to run the lightning talks here. And hey, we'd love to have you on this podcast, right? That's other people sowing support in my ideas. And I, I just want to make sure that I'm doing that for other people. And I just want to say thank you to all those who did that for me. Yeah, that's, that's brilliant. I, I've tried to teach my kids when they say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it on my own. You can't do it on your own. You need help. You need to know when to ask for help, and you need you need people around you. And and uh, yeah, that's hundred percent. That's beautiful message. You really can't do it alone. Um, so just make sure to thank those who supported you, and make sure you support those that you can. Really, that's that's what a community is. Okay, so we're out of time. Thank you again. This is Bill Kennedy with the Arn Labs podcast. Thank you for spending time with Mark and me. And Hopefully we'll see you again soon.